You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we doing live? Echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners. Welcome back to the Win the Day podcast. And I can't imagine a more fitting quote for today's episode than this quote from Wayne Dyer. Don't die with the music still in you. Don't die with the music still in you. Our guest today is one of the world's most influential musicians, Kenny Aronoff. Kenny has played on more than 60 Grammy-nominated or awarded recordings, totaling sales of more than 300 million units. In addition, the Recording Industry Association of America has certified more than 1,300 of the tracks Kenny has contributed to as gold, platinum, or diamond. He's been named one of the greatest drummers of all time by Rolling Stone magazine, and the list of artists he's worked with on the road or in the studio is a who's who of the music scene. You won't believe these names. John Mellencamp, the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Paul McCartney, Tom Petty, Sting, the Smashing Pumpkins, Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, Elton John, Rod Stewart, Johnny Cash, and I'm cherry picking here. There are hundreds of names on here. Dave Grohl, Alicia Keys, Beyonce, Celine Dion, and so many more. Uh, Kenny's winning approach to drumming and to life has given him the ability to stay successful for four decades in one of the most difficult industries in the world, the music business. If that resume wasn't enough, he's also the author of the amazing book, Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, and an inspirational speaker. In this episode, we're going to talk with Kenny about what it took for him to make it to the top of the music business, the craziest moments from his life on the road, the secrets of music composition, and the mindset it takes to stay at the top level. Gee, I'm pumped for this one. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. Let's win the day with legendary drummer Kenny Aronoff. Kenny, great to see you, my friend. Great intro, dude. I mean, <laughs> good night, everybody. Yeah. Hey, you pretty much spelled it out. Oh, good. Well, what a, what an incredible resume that, that you've got. To, yeah. to kick it off, I'd love to know just what is it about music more broadly that just captures the emotion and can instantly transport people back to a, a certain memory or moment or feeling from their lives? Well, well everybody has a, a soundtrack to their life, you know. The songs you heard when you were a kid, the songs you heard, you know, when you were in school and all that stuff. So that's one thing for sure. But people are feeling creatures. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> that's not an argument. People are feeling creatures. So, in, and that's one of, of I look at it, that's one of our, our most important experiences on this, in this lifetime we have, mm -hmm. is to, 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 to experience all kinds of experiences, uh, but from a feeling place. Mm -hmm. There's Plenty of things that get in the way of that, but you can't deny it. You know, when everybody goes into that thing where, like, they're struggling, it's because the feeling mm. is telling them what they should do, or what we, we really should do, or what we want to do, and the brain is getting in the way. And so we're feeling creatures. So music is one of those things that definitely accentuates that, you know, and brings that out. Yeah, it's one of, one of those things, you know, even if you are in a dark place, you then seek out some of that dark music. Like you might put on Johnny Cash Heard or some of those things that just really just give you that feeling. If you're in a dark place, it can be a little bit like dancing with the devil. Just as when you're in a good place, you want to have something to sort of heighten the enjoyment of that. Well, what you just said is very, very smart in that if you would recognize or if you do recognize what you just said, then you can be almost like the person helping you. Mm. You're the, the father, the son, the, the mother, the daughter, the coach, the, the, the player, where you say, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't listen to that dark music yeah. <laughs> while I'm in this place. <laughs> Maybe we should listen to whatever, Beethoven, mm. but something that is joyful. Yeah. And it's up to you to make the, that decision because, I mean, yeah. You want to feel pain? There's music that can make you feel pain. Mm -hmm. You know, like Trent mm -hmm. Reznor can bring you right down the rabbit hole if you yeah. want to go there. For sure. Uh, there's a lot of work now, research back, that says if you're overcoming trauma or want to get over some type of negative event that you've been through, replaying that event with positive music can actually make a big difference as well. So the power of music, I feel like they're just they're scratching the surface. And speaking of music, out of all the songs that you've played on, is there, a, is there one that you still hear today where whenever it comes on, you're just like, God, it was just cool that I was part of that experience? Jack and Diane. Yeah.
biggest number one hit single for John Mellencamp. <laughs> I mean, in my book, I describe how I, I mean, I was had to come up with that part on the spot, and I was in fear of losing my job. Basically, save the song, save my career, and. I mean, that song wasn't even going to be on the record. Yeah. And then I came up with a drum program and came up with this epic drum solo. It, it, I didn't even know once we came up with it, I was just glad it made it on the record. Then, it, you know, back in those days, they would test, um, rec, you know, singles. They'd play all the, sing, all the songs on the record on radio and people calling, oh, I like this, I like that. And that tested very high. Mm -hmm. And they released it as a second single, went to number one. And... I mean, it's still being played on the radio 40 years later and also like on Pandora, Spotify, and iTunes. I mean, and it's one of the two probably biggest drum solos on pop radio. The other one is uh, Phil Collins in the air tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, that blew John Cougar Mellencamp's career up, but completely uh, launched mine. And so when I hear that, I'm grateful such iconic and yeah. timeless tracks, aren't they? The two, yeah, the two you just geez. mentioned there. Very uh, fortunate. Yeah, for people who don't know as much about the art form of drumming itself, how complex are the drums to, compared to other instruments and roles in the band? And why is the – I noticed in your book you often talk about how the drummer in the – dozens of examples you gave in the book, the drummer is, is really considered the solid uh, and, and the most important role in, in the band. I mean, a, a good analogy would be the drummer is the, the engine in a car. No engine, no car. I don't care how pretty everything else is around it. No engine, no car. And depending on what kind of engine you have in a car. You know, Buddy Rich, of course, he's a drummer, and he, but he said the quote, but it makes sense. You show me a great band, and I'll show you a great drummer. Mm. You show me a bad drummer, and I'll show you a, a crap band. Mm. So, I mean, it's true. You're, and, 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 and the, you know, the, the drummer defines time, and feel or groove, and when everybody has to follow the drummer. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a thing with so guy. I listen as a drummer. I, I listen, I learn, and I lead. Mm -hmm. But I'm not the boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, listen, learn, and lead. I love that. Yeah. Your big focus was on drums, not drugs. And I think it's important for people, obviously, you enjoyed your time in the, in the rock sure. and roll lifestyle. Yes. How common was it to see people never reach the heights they could have because they couldn't escape the clutches of the vices like drugs or sex or gambling and all those different things? Alcohol? Well, well I mean, we have that, you know, the iconic tw age 27, mm -hmm. Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, um, Janis Joplin. Uh, um, um, spacing the uh, may, uh, maybe Kurt Cobain at twenty seven, and then um, spacing her name um, who female singer from England who, you know that's it's crazy you know, um, I think when you're young uh and and these people uh, in some cases probably thought, I mean you're young you're invincible mm. you know this has worked hey this worked you know. Uh, recently, uh, you know, I've lost a, a good friend, um, you know, and I, it, it, it might, I've seen this where people get used to this is working, you know, mm -hmm. take this, you do that. Yeah, yeah, I woke up, I'm fine. And then, and then it, there's that fine line where, mm -hmm. you know, especially with drugs now where you get mm -hmm. things like fentanyl that can slow your heart down to nothing mm -hmm. and you just don't think it's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. The thing with me, and I've seen, I mean, I'm in high school, I, I mean, freshman in college. I saw somebody shooting heroin. They they asked me to tie them off. I passed out. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw they got high. I pass out, and this guy was high as waking me up. Mm -hmm. You know, it terrified me. Um, I never went into that that direction. You know, mm -hmm. the thing you know that I think ultimately has kept me in check, and I don't have the addictive uh, DNA. Like you know, I'm not l literally an alcoholic. You know, if I drink, I can drink. And then I die, stop. It's not like, oh, I, you know, I wake up and start drinking. Uh, or a, a, a addicted to any, you know, you know, thing like a heroin or something. The thing that has kept me in check is that my career is always, is number one over everything. It's mm -hmm. always been over relationships, over everything. It's just the way I'm wired. I am, there's no brakes on this, this uh, rocket ship. It just goes until the gas runs out. Mm -hmm. And so for me, let's say I, I've had plenty of hangovers. So, you know, <laughs> hangover and playing in front of 20,000 people is not fun. 
So that means they're like, whew, I cracked that thing. I literally would stop drinking for a week or two. Yeah. You would be letting a lot of people down, you know, least of all if you're working for John Mellencamp or whoever and you've got 50,000, 80,000 people. Oh, I'll crowd. tell you the exact story. Yeah. I would, we were selling out arenas, just us, no opening act. We were the biggest thing in America, one of the biggest things. And um, we, I went out, we were in Philly, and I went out with, I had a night off and went out with the, the people who, the Tama people, who that's the drums I play. We went out and I'm drinking sake and beer and everything's fine until I got to my room and I'm spinning and I'm puking. And I'm... Next day, we had to drive to Hershey, Pennsylvania, play in a big arena. And of course, that and Rolling Stone magazine is with us and they're doing a cover story on John. <laughs> you know, um, and the drum machine I had that gives me the tempos, I'm like, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Breaks. <laughs> and I don't have a backup. Yeah. Because I back then, I didn't have backup. I'm scrambling, and you know, and we're playing sold out, 360. I mean, that was obviously I remember that because I'm still talking about it. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> Who's putting on these parties? These infamous parties that you hear so much about? Do the record label do it because they just want everyone to have fun and get out there, or is it the band? I, and and what can you describe? Who puts on these parties and what an example of one of those scenes would be like? Well, I mean, I can give you one example. In the Mellencamp band, we had a hospitality room, and. Uh, we weren't Motley Crue, we weren't like uh, Van Halen, but we did have a hospitality room. And, the, you know, this would be like an example. I'd be like, in, you know, 20,000 people singing our songs. And I'd go, I remember one time, <laughs> I was on the Jubilee or Scarecrow tour, Scarecrow tour. I said to my tech, come on here. And it was a humongous stage. He comes running and comes, what's wrong, boss? What's wrong? And I said, oh, man, you see the girl in the third row with the striped shirt? I'll give her an after show pass. He goes, you got it. You know, everybody's up dancing and singing. And he gets behind her, he taps her on the, on the shoulder, and she's like, what? And he says, blah, 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 blah. I see all this going on. Actually, he was behind her going, is this the one? I went, yeah, that's the one. And I'm playing, ain't that America? Do do my part? Yeah, yeah that's the one. No, no, no. And she's like, you know, it's, and I, we then we had, we have, we were all very polite. You know, we weren't like, you know, <laughs> Like some other bands, but we, you know, no put down for anybody. But the thing is, we, yeah, they, that was a way you'd meet your audience back there. And then if, if we spent the night, we would say, come back to the hotel, meet us in the bar. And then, you know, whatever happens, happens. But that, we we put that on, yeah. you know. And uh, actually, that's how I met my second wife. She got <laughs> pulled up on stage at Madison Square Garden. John would, Mellencamp would bring somebody up on stage to dance in the encore under the boardwalk. And me and the bass player would go, yay, nay, yay. It was a yay for her. <laughs> and it was funny because I didn't even meet her that night. She came back to another show because she got off stage and somebody took the ph photographer said, hey, I got pictures. He was trying to hit on her. I got pictures of you on stage with Mellencamp. And so she reached out to him and they didn't come out great. He says, well, I'm going to the next concert in Jersey. This was in New York. Now they're going to Jersey. I'm going to, you probably can find out from the tour manager who the other photographers were. And get blah, blah, blah. It was a whole line so he could probably... Anyway, soon as she walked there, she was dressed like amazing, really hot. Our crew had passes. And they'd go put... Before the concert, they'd put backstage <laughs> passes on hot girls. And I'd go back to the dressing room and i oh my God, that's that girl from Madison Square Garden. And that's how we became friends. It was a slow build to eventually... Getting married. <laughs> yeah, that's great. One of my favorite themes from your book, you said you never make it, you're always trying to make it. And you alluded to that a little bit earlier today. Can you explain a little bit about that mentality of you never make it, you're always trying to make it, and how that was such a big part of, of your success? Okay, the line is this. I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend my entire life trying to be as great as I can be. I'll never be as great as I want to be, I accept that because my goals are way out there. But I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. And that's like a, a running back in football. These guys are monsters. The most massive, incredible athletes. But they don't score touchdowns every time they get the ball. Spend their entire career play by play, game by game, season by season, trying to get in the end zone. They're trying, sometimes they get 10 yards, sometimes they get two, sometimes they get minus. Sometimes they fumble, sometimes they break their leg. They're always focused on the end zone. And that I call the human condition. You accept that life 
is about adapt or die. You know, you can be as prepared as you want. If you're talking about football, think about Tom Brady, seven Super Bowl rings. This guy is mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually so prepared before he even steps on the field. But when he gets on that line and that ball's hiked, I call it adapt or die. Mm. You don't know what the hell's coming at you. They're trying to fool you on the other side of that line. They're designed to fool you. Sometimes he might get sacked. Sometimes he might throw an interception. Sometimes he might fumble. That's his worst nightmare. But that guy is exactly what I'm talking about. You can see him angry, but you see him immediately readjust and go, what's my North Star here? Score a touchdown. Get in the end zone. So what did I just learn, and how can I be the best person I can be? And it's 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 just it, trying to be the best that you can be. Once you accept that, then you're not boggled and, and weighed down and frozen in, in, in a place of like, oh, my God, I messed up. This is where you pivot from being a child to an adult, where you actually realize, oh, my God. Are we allowed to swear on this thing? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. shit's going to happen, man. Mm-hmm. Shit's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And once you accept that and realize that, and, and this is where you learn. When you really learn something, it's when you feel it. It's not just here, it's here. When you feel the power of, all right, that just happened. What's my North Star? And you've experienced how, oh my God, you can get out of that dark place very quickly and go to the what, what is your main focus is to win. And once you experience how powerful that is, then you move from the being the child to the adult. And this is a very, very hard transition that people will have because if you don't make that transition, you're frozen in life. You're absolutely frozen in that place, you know? And that's where that line came up from. You know, I'll never be as great as I want to be. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be because I get it now. I really do get it. You know, you're trying so hard. In order to be great, it's all about you. It's all about me. Mm. To be Tom Brady, it's about we. Now it's not the individual. It's like, wow, the power of team. And I actually asked an NFL player this year, uh, and I says, listen, is it really true? Is Tom Brady really that cool? And he went, oh, yeah. He walks on the field. He embraces everybody. He makes friends with everybody. You know, uh, he's, I'm using him as an example because, you know, you hear people go, oh, man, you should give other people a chance. What kind of statement is that? Give other people a chance. You're looking at a historical thing here. Did people get upset because Einstein created ooh, too many, you know, a genius formulas? No, you want to get the greatest. Did Michelangelo paint a little too many great things? I mean, what is what kind of that's a loser mentality? You shouldn't say, "Oh, he should shit." No, he should be as great as he should be, and you should be as great as you should be. And if you, if, you know, compete. I mean. This is like, I don't even, can't even relate to that. Yeah. That's Just get out of my way. You, that's the most stupid, ignorant thing you could ever say. Greatness is great. I want to see him come back and win another Super Bowl. I want to see, I'm studying this guy. Yeah. Why did he do that? He won by accident. <laughs> I've heard that Tom Brady also texted his players every single day to remind them that they were going to win the Super Bowl in the lead up. I mean, little things like that, just planting that seed. It's why leaders like Elon Musk are so successful at bringing the right people to them because they have that mission. Exactly. Let them be as great as they can be. Exactly. These guys are, are team players. It's not about me. It's about we. And and ironically, I mean, I... I came up with that thing on my own, but I saw it was on the, on the, uh, uh, the, um, you know, uh, the LA, you know, football team. They had the, uh, they had one of the guys had it on his. It's about it's we, not me, on his jersey. Mm. The Rams. I'm spacing. On, I can't believe I spaced on anything in football, but yeah. And and I heard recently that Tom Brady, at a golf tournament in the, in the summer, summer was in the in the. Uh, you know, out in the parking lot doing wind sprints. Somebody said, what are you doing, man? You got to go in. You got to do something. So I'm, uh, I'm practicing for the Super Bowl. And he's going like, Super Bowl? It's June. <laughs> this guy, I've always thought, he mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, is always thinking of the Super Bowl 24-7. As soon as the game is over, the season's over, he's already thinking. 
That's a winning attitude. And he's a team player. Like you said, Elon Musk. These guys hire the best mm. to be with them. Yeah. Oh, I, and this is a, dis, a very huge distinction. In order for me to be the drummer I became, or I'm still trying to be, oh my God, it was all about me. Practicing eight hours a day. Day I graduated high school. Practice, practice, practice. Me, me, me. How do I sound? How do I look? What do you think, teach? What do you think? This? What do you think? That's fine, but in order to be really successful and stay successful, you pivot from not, it's not about me. Mm -hmm. How do I serve the artist that I'm working with, the band? How do I become the greatest drummer I can possibly be for that guy's music, that band? How do I serve the musicians, the producer, the engineer, the record label? Serve you, serve me, serve everybody. What can I do? And the North Star is this, to get the song on the radio to be a number one hit single. It's not about me. Get the song on the radio to be number one. That might mean don't play at all. Mm. What? But it was a huge switch. In my book, I talk about when I had that traumatic, like you're fired when I just got into the band. That was what I learned. That was the takeaway. I went, oh my God. Holy, it's not about what beat I play. It's what can I do to get that guy's song on the record and then get it on the radio and then be a number one hit. I think it was Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins who had mentioned in your book about your reliability that you can only build up through years and years of doing the right thing, always being available and being a team player to move the whole ship forward, the best interest of everyone. I mean, that's, that's yep. just, you know, speaks a lot to your, to your character. How, how do you handle creative differences between band members and, and record labels? Uh, every movie you watch, the record execs are the, the worst, most yeah. toxic people in the world. Yeah. How do you handle the creative differences between all of those um, stakeholders? Once again, you have to serve the room. Do, I probably get hired as much uh, for my ability to connect with people, communicate with people. Once you can connect and communicate with people on a personal level, mm -hmm. from a feeling level, now you can collaborate. And there's all kinds of wackadoodles in the uh, music <laughs> business. You know, everybody except me, I'm perfect. No, I'm <laughs> but the point is, is that it's the uh, the ability to, to step back and, and look at it from almost like a producer's standpoint and being able to deal with all those personalities. And no, I've few times, if you see me take my headphones off and put them on the drums, and I come walking into a, a studio, that means I'm I'm going to lay some law down. <laughs> uh, very nicely, but that means they've gone too far. Mm. But I can take a lot. But there's a certain point where I'm going to say, hey, man, th now it's it, at this point, I'm not going to be able to serve anybody because you, mm. you, you're crossing the line. And I'll say something. but And that puts your energy off. Is that right? So yeah. you can't deliver where you want to be. I mean, one example, it might have been in my book. I can't, was there a story where I was do, doing a Tony Iommi record, the, the guitar player from Sabbath, with Billy Corgan. And, you know, Billy walks in. Uh, we had just finished a world tour with the Smashing Pumpkins. They were the biggest alternative band in the world the, on the Adore album. And I was replacing a good friend of mine who's one of the greatest drummers out there, Jimmy Chamberlain, one of the, you know, founding members of Smashing Pumpkins. Anyway, I did the tour and we're doing uh, two songs on the Tony album, Tony Ioni album. And they stayed in the control room and I was out in the big drum room to get big sounds. But, and it was a song, I didn't even hear the vocals until the song, the album came out. They, we were composing this song on the spot. And Billy suddenly gets, they hit, pushes down the talk back button. He's yelling at me, no, nah, the chorus, the chorus. And that's when I went, head, and phone's off. I walked in the control room, and I gave twenty dollars to the uh, assistant engineer. And I said, "Hey, listen, when those guys talk, hold down that button so I know what they're talking about." <laughs> and I walked back in there, and every time they discuss something, that guy held <laughs> the button so I knew how. The, I didn't know what the chorus was. My yeah. chart. I'm. I'm really known for writing every single note out. But these sections were like, it was like, okay, A section, B section, kind of A section, dark section, purple section, halftime section. I mean, I, there was no lyrics. There was nothing. So I didn't know what was in 
Billy's head. That was my point. But don't <laughs> yell at me if I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> That's what be on the, the message same page. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. All right, let's get back into the fun. You mentioned radio hits earlier. How difficult is it to predict and even manufacture a radio hit? Totally unpredictable because, mm. you you know, there's so many variables. You may think there's a hit, but you, you don't know where people are at mm. out there. Their, their tastes are changing, and you're at the mercy of the record label. Mm. It takes money to get a record played on the radio. It takes money mm. to promote. It takes money for a publicist. It takes money to put a band on tour. Think about it. Planes, buses, uh, you know, uh, vehicles, semis, crews. I mean, there's so many variables. It's a team. It's an effort to get a song to get even to be heard. Mm. And then once it's heard and everybody's done everything they can possibly do, now it's up to what people want to hear. Mm. and But there is some obvious ones. I'll give you a number one hit single that I thought it wasn't even going to make the record. I'll Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That by Meatloaf <laughs> on Bad Out of Hell 2. Record, the album has sold 40 million copies, at least of, to date. That song, <laughs> we, we recorded in L.A. right here, it was eight and a half minute song. Radio likes three and a half minute songs. So I went... That's crazy. You'll never make it on the record. I get a call a year later to do another two and a half minutes for this intro. On the piano, I'm like, I was laughing my ass off, going like, all right, you're paying me. This is never. Song gets released. They whittled it down for a radio single at seven and a half minutes. That's already twice as long. Song was number one in 20 countries in the same week. And the record, it, it, it reignited his career. Uh, he became all of a sudden this huge guy again. I, I couldn't believe it. I just told everybody, if you want advice from me, do the opposite. <laughs> I'll get some stock tips from you uh, after, Kenny. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Another song was a duet with um, Don Henley and um, Patti Smythe from Scandal. She was in a band. And we're doing this record. And it was just when the grunge thing came out. Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, you know, and it's this pretty ballad that called Sometimes Love Just Ain't Enough. She sings, pretty thing. he sings. I mean, it's beautiful. I'm like, guys, I'm wasting your time. Nobody's going to play this <laughs> shit on the radio. Nobody wants to hear this. You know, they're listening to the punk. The world is a vampire. <laughs> and then, or, you know, <laughs> Teen spirit, or you know, whatever, you know, dark stuff. You know, song was like number one on every chart, but the top 100, it was like maybe stayed at number two because something was like Boys to Men was out. But I mean, it was huge. Mm. Once again, I was completely wrong. Yeah. Like Guns N' Roses, November Rain. That was another long track that ended up having yeah. a commercial appeal. So hard to predict this, isn't it? It's, it's, the, it, it's you can never get it 100% right. Mm. Too many variables. Mm. It's, and, yeah. From all the uh, amazing performers, you know, some of the names you read out during the intro, it, quite extraordinary. Um, is there a commonality you noticed in terms of work ethic or what is it that sets them apart? Well, work ethic is the key word. Guys like Bon Jovi, massive work. You know, he's the type of guy you get off stage and he's rethinking, you know, Mellencamp, thinking nonstop, Billy Corgan, you know, and I'm one of those guys. When I was on tour with the Smashing Pumpkins, Billy would change the set 30 minutes before the show. He wanted the tension. Yeah. He wanted people to be like crapping in their pants. Like the, the, the guitar techs were freaking. I'd go in and have a meeting with Billy uh, and I'd write everything down. So I'd write everything down. And he loved this. You know, I'd write it down so you could count on me. But I'd go tell everybody in the band, you know, what's going on. If you didn't write it down, I mean, you know, it was like, what? You know, the chorus gets real big in this tonight. It's going to be just acoustic guitar, Billy, and my hi-hat. Like a complete opposite. And, you know, 
I'm not going to mention names, but a lot of people wouldn't remember that. So it, it, Billy and I, I'd write it down. I'd have to write it down. I would take me. I wanted to be as great as I can be. And it was a huge feeling in the shoes of a great drummer. And the fans, they don't like it when they don't see a, a, a member in the band. Mm. You know, and so, you know, I mean, I saw the reviews and people were going like, wow, you know, Aronoff doesn't play like Jimmy Chamberlain. Of course not. And Billy told me, do your own thing, man. Just be 100%. He was smart. You can't be somebody else. Nobody can be anybody else. And Jimmy's really di distinctive style. So I became this, you know, the way I play with very much a lot of authority and just laid it down. And they'd go, and this was the thing. They'd go, oh, man, he's not Jimmy Chamberlain. And then they go, but you know what? By the end of the show, I went, man, this guy's great at what he does. And Jimmy even told me that. He says, man, you you were smart. You just played like you. He says, you're the only guy that got that right. He's trying to play like, you just did your own thing. Mm. And he validated that. But my point is, I would take the board tapes and rewrite all my charts, the, any song that that Billy had changed to the new way. And that guy had a photographic memory. Mm. He could pull out a song that we hadn't done for two weeks, and he knew memorized what I had played from his instruction two weeks prior. If I mi missed one cymbal crash, he'd go, what are you doing, Kenny? I couldn't believe it. Incredible. So I was, at, and we were we were like fly every night after a gig. We'd be like in Russia one day, Germany the next. Uh, there was one day we woke up, we were in Dublin partying with you 2 Boy, was I hung over that night. <laughs> Those boys can drink. And then we flew to the Netherlands, played this big, the Pink Pop Festival, huge thing. And, you know, everybody was there to see the pumpkins, you know. And then, you know, people were like, oh, my God, who's the drummer now, you know, and checking it out. And we did the entire Door Adore record, which people were like, they wanted to hear more of the hits, but this Adore record was so different. And then after we got done with the show, got on the plane and flew to Paris. Three countries in one day. Wow. And I'm like, you know, writing that night, listening to the thing. Oh, my, we're doing a different night, you know. It was just me trying to be as great as I can be. Who who stands out to you in terms of just sheer musical genius? Is there any anyone that really comes to mind? Well, one of them is Billy Corgan. Mm. <laughs> you know, Elton John. Mm. And we, Johnny Cash. Mm. I mean, I'm trying to jump around. Um, you know, um, oh, uh, let's see. I have to go through my right. Ray Charles. Mm. How about Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis, who I played together? I played with Jerry Lee Lewis on his last performance before he had his stroke. And, uh, I mean, these guys are geniuses. At, they reinvented music, you know? Mm. I mean, Jerry in the 50s with, with his his cousin, Jimmy Swaggart. They, 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 uh, Jimmy Swaggart's son told me this because I went and visited. I went to Jerry's 85th birthday two years ago with Jimmy Swaggart and Mickey Gilly, who just died. They were all three cousins, all three cousins, and all became successful. And Jimmy and 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 Little Richard, they all they would go listen to. It. This was like, a, I mean, these people were poor. They go and listen to these black people playing music. I don't know where it was. It might have been a a club or just a place. And they'd be listening. And they went into the black neighborhood in like the boonies in Louisiana somewhere, knocking on the door, and and. and this black piano player opens up the the door and goes, what are you boys doing here? And they're little teeny little kids, you know. We want to know what chord you're playing. He says, what chord? What are you hearing me playing chords? We, we were listening outside that building you're playing it. Anyway, he showed them the chord, and from there they created rock and roll. Mm. Wow. I mean, that's... And then, I mean, it's just amazing. So those are some of the people. And another genius I'll go to... Leonard Bernstein, one of the greatest uh, composers, conductors, American composer, conductors in the in, in in ever. I mean, there's a guy if people don't know. I mean, he I mean he did West Side Story, but he had compositions that were you know written for symphony orchestras. And I saw this guy a score when they conduct. They have a score. I mean, it, I don't know thirty different 
parts and different clefs. It's like not everything's written in the G clef. It's the bass clef, the tenor clef, the alto clef. The, the, I mean, it's insanity. And he can read everybody's, he knows technically what every, the oboes, the double read, the clarinets, the single read, the flutes, the, the, the French horns, the, you know, the, the string instruments, the, the percussion. I mean, he knows everything about every instrument. And he could sit at the piano and basically play the outline of an entire orchestral composition and say, you know, this composer, let's say it was Ravel in 1920, did this. But 1919, they never had that chord. It was this. And Ravel kind of did this, a sharp seventh, a flat 13th, whatever. And he says, interesting enough is that that sound was kind of went with the, the way the whole culture was happening in Europe. I mean, he put the whole thing together. I had never seen, I was right behind him in a private, like, little gathering. Uh, you know, uh, this guy's a genius. What about, like, Beethoven and Mozart? Like, those Same original thing. composers. How These guys they could hear things. <laughs> yeah. They could hear complete scores in their head, write it down on paper without playing it, mm -hmm. then play it. Every note they wrote and heard was exact. Mm -hmm. Incredible brain, isn't I it? I mean, uh, Beethoven wrote... The biggest piece, you know, the Ninth Symphony with the big choir. He was deaf. He wrote that entire composition deaf. But when he hit, he could see his finger, he could hear in his head all the notes. Mm. Incredible amount of work behind the scenes to, to do that. Um, talent alone, as we know, in any industry, it's not enough. Like I used to work at a live music venue in Brisbane and Australia, and I would see these exceptionally talented musicians playing to 10 people. It used to just break my heart knowing yeah. that they had to go and take on some other job just to, to pay the bills. This is a bit of a hard question, but for people who, not even necessarily for musicians, but you can obviously reference that, uh, when should someone throw in the, their towel Someone, when should someone throw in the towel on their dreams if they feel like it's just not going to, to make it for them and they just go and do something completely different? Like what would have it taken for you to throw in the towel with your drumming career and go and do something just completely separate because you felt like you couldn't make it? I have a phrase called never say die. Mm. If you're really that person, well, first of all, you can only throw in the towel. Mm. And it's, everyone's got their own breaking point, you know. Maybe if I chop both my arms off, I might say, yeah, I'd probably start something else. But, I mean, the thing is, <laughs> everyone's got their breaking point. I mean, you know, some people, uh, they can't live any other way. Mm. So they, they'll play for 10 people till they die, or they'll play in their, you know, I could not, there's not one answer to that. You mm. know, everyone, it's an individual thing. Um, some passions, they're just things that you just follow yeah. forever, even if it doesn't bring that financial. I mean, you know, it's like, it. You know, music becomes a, a way of life, a survival. I mean, some people uh, just can't. There's nothing else in life to do. This is what keeps them alive. Mm. You know, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a speaker, so, you know, I get in front of people and I feel just as great speaking in front of people as I do playing the drums. And the cool thing is I do both when I speak. You know, I have an agent, I, you know, teamwork, you know, innovation, creativity, you know, realize your purpose in life, you know, the three C's, connect, communicate, collaborate, that type of stuff. I talk about that stuff, you know, and hopefully inspire people. That feels great. It's not just, not only is do I speak, but then now I'm an author, but I did something that, man, it's almost impossible to do. And I can't, I mean, I was doing it, but it actually worked. And that is, usually you're a drummer in a band and that's it. Mm. And you're a drummer only playing that style of music. And then, oh, or you're a session guy. And I created both worlds and then broke the mold of, oh, he's the only, he only plays rock. He doesn't play country. Look at the guy, like I played on the Highwaymen record. That's Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, Waylon Jennings, the Highwaymen. These boys, these men wanted me to tour with them. These guys are the heaviest mofos in the world. <laughs> they make rockers look like a joke. These guys, and they're super intelligent, 
These guys, I mean, the type of stuff they did, these were real men, man. These were tough guys. <laughs> I mean, Waylon was picking cotton, I think. He grew up on a mud floor in, somewhere in Texas. I mean, these guys were amazing. And, and so they've they seen the world. Mm. So if they like you, <laughs> they ain't doing you no favors because they like you. That guy doesn't go on tour with the Pumpkins. Mm. Are you kidding me? I don't know how it happened, but it happened. In other words, if they don't pick, the Smashing Pumpkins doesn't pick a country guy. And if they're going to audition a drummer, it's going to be a very specific type of drummer, not just any rock drummer, a certain type of rock drummer, an alternative rock. I don't know what. My point is I broke mold after mold after mold after mold. And I don't know how. I mean, I, I could try to list how it happened, but well, that, thank that God adaptability. It did. Yeah, you mentioned adaptability earlier in this interview. That adaptability is such a big thing that led you to all of those different opportunities, and that can keep you persistent even if you feel like you were at the end of your rope with one band. Sure enough, you know, in the book you talk about how uh, who was it? You were playing. You were committed to the Smashing Pumpkins for their tour, and was it John Fogerty wanted you to go on tour around the same time? It's like, well. Yeah. It's awkward to be in that situation, but it's much better to have the two options than no options because you had adaptability and you were persistently pursuing your potential, which is what led to so much. Well, the, the key thing is you got to want to be adaptable. you got to want to do this. Thing. I'm wired. Well, I, I just, you know, maybe that's why I'm on my third wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if I get married again, I'm going to remarry her. I told her, <laughs> you know. If I go with fourth marriage, it's going to be the same woman again. <laughs> or not at all. Strike three, you're out. But the point is, is I, I am definitely wired that I get excited to do different things. Mm -hmm. You really can be wired that way. And so instead of fighting it, I just go with it. So, um, and, but, but, you know, I, it, I almost didn't have a choice, you know. I, I was on tour with Bob Seeger, which also sells out arenas, and he's got this ridiculous, you know, catalog of music. And I heard that... Uh, the Smashing Pumpkins, you know, something had happened with Jimmy, had to leave the band, they needed a drummer, and I had sent a resume in to them for that, and also, you know, just, they asked me to send it in. And um, and then it was two years later I got the call, and they they were saying, by the way, your resume ate up our fax machine for about like 40 <laughs> minutes, because it was so long when they had fax machines. But, um, and, and then when I got the call, I mean, yeah, John was disappointed, but I was explaining to him I was seeking the to play with the Pumpkins before I'd ever even played with John mm. live. That came before, and I looked at it as like I was a big fan of the Pumpkins, loved the music, and it was different, and I wanted to be, I wanted my, that this would come from a, from a place in my heart. I really wanted to play something different but i love john fogarty's McCreedence. are you kidding me i've been playing with john fogarty on and off for like 28 years you know it's like oh my god i mean the catalog is insane mm. but i want to try that too so i did it and you know it was it, 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 you know i run into this all the time i you know i get i get i get uh calls where oh my god oh my god they want me to go on tour with them but i'm already with them and I'm just, I try to work it out somehow. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, I've done the crazy stuff, like fly from Hong Kong with Mellencamp. I think that was in my book. And then I fly, you know, to Japan, to Detroit land, get in the helicopter, fly to the palace, which is an hour and a half drive. That's why I have a helicopter from the airport. And, and I'm on stage five minutes before the band for sound check. Sold out three nights at the palace with, uh, you know, Bob Seger in his home city. <laughs> But I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. Hell we'll of a fly life, from Frank up Frankfurt to to somewhere. Was it Frankfurt? Frankfurt to Amsterdam to Minneapolis. Get off the plane, go to soundcheck with um, um, Sammy Hagar for a corporate <laughs> event. And that was maybe three years ago. <laughs> Why not sleep on the plane? My land, you know, practicing the music every night after the show on the bus. That's great. Yeah, if, if you would. When it comes to like skill acquisition, if you were teaching someone how to play the drums, but the goal was for them to be able to pick it up ASAP, like as quickly as possible, is there a way that you would teach them or is there a way that you would impart any skill onto someone else that isn't traditionally taught? Yeah, well, I'd, first of all, I'd, you, you go real basic. Everything in drumming is, to me, is based on four things. Still, even no matter how complex, 
If I hand you a pair of sticks and I want you to play with me, first thing you should be thinking about is what beat am I going to play? Because whatever beat you play, I have to, I have to adapt to that. Mm. Okay. First two notes you hit defines time. It's like a measurement. Gut, gut. Now, you're going to keep solid tempo. It's gut, 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 gut. You, you repeat that measurement and you're doing your job. It's keeping <laughs> solid time. Um, the third thing is feel. You gotta make it feel like something. And everybody is wired different. We're totally different emotionally. So you wanna bring that out. You want that to flow. Now you that's a cake. It's like a cake without the icing. That's most of what you're eating. And that foundation, now you can be creative. The fourth ingredient. You can be creative with the icing and decorate, but don't mess up that foundation. Mm. So I don't care if you're going or like ACDC, you know, uh, back in black, you know, or, or, or even cashmere. Simple beat, yeah? Well, he's keeping perfect time, making it feel good, placing everything right in the right place, listening to everybody. Few creative things. Got the that symbol. He's adding creative things to that foundation. If you disrupt that foundation, you blow it. And so, and then it could be, you know, that's beat time groove. And so you, so you start going into the creative thing. That's all creative stuff as long as you don't mess up beat time groove. So what I would do with you is I'd say, I want you to sit down and I want you to play this with your, on the hi-hat. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to count. One, two, three, four. You're playing twice as many beats as one, two, three. Three, as a matter of fact, this would be one and two and three, subdividing between one and two and two and three and th three and four and four and one. Now, when I say one and three, you hit play with your bass drum, and every bass drum has to land when you hit one and three here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. They line together. One, two, three, four. One. So we do that. That's basic stuff. Most people can do that. Now, when you hit two and when you say two and four, I want you to hit your your other hand, which would be the snare drum. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. Now, here's what gets tricky. Now, when you hit one and say one and three, I want you to hit the bass drum. One. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Good it in, did it in. Good, and then I'll put music on. Dun, gain it in, did it in. Now, where the feel comes in, you could be robotic, like, oh, 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 trying to be stiff. Or, <laughs> oh, she got me. And you, it's you go deep, and when you're feeling like, what I'm feeling in me is like putting all this subdivision in there, you know. Whatever your feel is, and that is like basic drumming right there. Doesn't that seem basic? Yeah, seems like real logical on paper, yeah. but it. Where the challenge is, is that where your coordination is in your body, you what happens is some people, it's just not natural to mm -hmm. do any one of those things. You're going against what you naturally like to do. And so you can unlearn all of that and, and learn to do this. Mm -hmm. I have a thing called RPS. The repetition of every, any skill is the preparation P for success. You want to throw a football? Great. Mm. Whoosh, 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 a thousand times a day. Mm. I bet you in one week, you'll be able to throw a football better than the first throw.
Yeah. You know, and it's so like Andre Agassi's dad said you can't beat a tennis player who's hitting a thousand tennis balls a day. Yeah. Mm. And Michael Jordan, yeah. all of them, you know, uh, you know, it's just it's repetitious. I still have a routine. I do 30 minutes before sound check, 30 minutes before the show, and sometimes 30 minutes at three in the morning mm. because it's just certain skills. Just that's why Tom Brady was doing wind sprints. Yeah. It's just, we're not robots. For sure. Uh, last question before we go into the win the day rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard that you could show yourself on your worst day? On my best, say that again. On my best on day. On your best day, what's an affirmation or something positive that you would write on a flashcard that you could show yourself on your worst day? Oh, it's my statement. I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life being as great as I can be. And with mm. that statement, I understand that, dude, just focus on the end zone. Mm. You know, I don't believe in the words. I don't use these words anymore. I'm going to say them right now. I don't believe in mistakes or failures. I believe they're just events. Mm. Because if, and I'll show you how powerful words are. If I said, uh, is, your, is your dad alive? Mm -hmm. Okay. What if I said your dad just died? Even when I say it, I'm like, oh, that's creepy. But what if I said, I love you, man? I really love you, man. You're... Even when I say the word love, you get, I got a little cortisol thing. So if I say to myself, you fucked up. Oh, God. That triggers your teachers, your parents, your brother, your sister, your priest, your, your coaches, your whoever, from way back as a childhood. Those things don't ever leave. So if you say that to yourself, man, it, you're not only triggering stuff but now you're distracting you from doing a great job what if i say i got this kenny i got this man dude don't worry and you understand i'll never be as great as i want to be but i'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as i can you understand it's really cool if you can push this out of the way and focus on doing a great job because you know it's gonna it's gonna turn around and and you're gonna feel better because you you you've seen it happen mm -hmm. So that's why that line is so powerful. That Such line, a good when you're having a day that's not the day you want, hang in there, man. Just be tough. Just say, you know what? I'm human. Mm -hmm. You know, my day may actually be doing maybe better than I think. It's mm -hmm. just my head. We're just a sack of chemicals. Mm -hmm. You know how you wake up down someday? Why? Who? Forget. Who cares? You're down. Point is, that we're never in the same place all the time. So, I mean, shit happens, man. You're down. So just get on with it. Just get through the day. Do things that will help you along. You get past the day. Wake up the next day. Now, if you're still down that day, then you're going to have to start looking deeper and maybe what you're eating, exercise, you know, all that stuff. Mm. Love it, Kenny. Let's now move into the win the day rocket round. Ten questions for some quick answers. You ready for this one? Okay, I gotta remember this one. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Well, that one, but there's another one. I, can I? I gotta have to read it because I wrote it on a piece go of paper. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Because I okay. <clears throat> a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity because they're a pessimist, but an optimist, me sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So good. I love that. So good. It's like... Ready to run through a wall after... Yeah, it's like, I'll see the... I'm always looking for the opportunity in any difficulty. Yeah. I mean, that's how you get touchdowns. And in your book, yes, yeah, in your book, you say that uh, your glass is never half empty, which is which is great. Like it's, it's never half full either. Never, yeah, yeah. You know what it is. Yeah. It's always full. Yeah. That's what it is. Your glass is always full because that's an optimist. Yeah. It's always full. Yeah. You know what? And, then, and you know, just keep pouring into it. And that's a good segue for our second question. Morning coffee or evening wine? Shots in the morning, <laughs> shots at night. Sorry, it's not coffee or wine. It's both. <laughs> both is the most common answer, actually, on this show. Is it really? Yeah. yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Ah. Oh. I wrote that down. Can I look at my notes? Of course, yeah. You guys, I wrote this down because <laughs> I, I thought about it. Okay, the 18, okay. Um, uh, I use this in my speech. Be efficient with your time. Mm -hmm. Time is everything. 
You know, my uncle, my uncle Nat was a tough mofo. He was doing one-handed push-ups. I was 11 years old in my bedroom because it was Thanksgiving. He was a, a Golden Gloves boxer, fighter, pilot, self-made millionaire. He's doing one-handed push-ups, smoking a cigar, a glass of scotch on the floor, and he's, he's laughing at me <laughs> as I walk in. I'm like, I'm terrified of this guy. And he was real muscular and strong. He goes, hey, kid, you know what the most valuable thing in life is? And I'm like... I see his expensive gold watch and went, money! <laughs> I think I got it right. He goes, he stands up and goes, slugs him in the arm and goes, no, time is the most valuable thing. And I'm like, time? I'm like, time to go to school, time to go to bed, time to do homework, I don't know, whatever. And then I thought, thinking maybe later that year, oh my God, he knew I was a drummer. He was thinking, yeah. you got to keep time, kid. You got to keep time. <laughs> and it is one of the most, and then I realized what he was really saying. He was sharing with me, dude, clock is ticking yeah you want to be a drummer do it man he saw it he was sh sharing he was putting time and purpose together mm -hmm. for me i didn't know that back then i look back and go oh my god he saw something in me and was trying to say kid listen mm -hmm. if you really want to do this music thing man you want to drummer you do it man the mm -hmm. clock is ticking time is short it's like it's gone gone and that to me is the advice i give an 18 year old because yeah. at 18 you still think mm -hmm time i got a thousand years left yeah you're drifting the, there's a quote um time. That, you know I, I felt like i was very much drifting at the age of at the age of 18 and, and for several years beyond that as well there's a dennis kimbrough quote that says time is not running out but your life is and it's <laughs> right that's isn't brilliant. It? yeah it's that's powerful. Brilliant. uh number four what book do you gift the most there's a book that, i'd say i don't give books off that but there's a great book i give people it's called the the four, ah, well, let me, I wrote it down. The this four agreements? Like, the, yeah, the four agreements. The four agreements. That's one of Tom Brady's favorites as well. Is yeah, really? I've read of that, yeah. The, the, well, and I'll tell people who who haven't read that book, there's two very powerful ones in there that really resonated with me right away, and that is, this is the heaviest. Don't take anything personal. Oh, my God, that's the most difficult thing. So when, you know, let's say I'm working for an artist, and they're completely screaming and going nuts on me. It's not about me. They're having a bad day. Who knows what they're going through? They might, you know, they could be going through all kinds of stuff. But they're yelling at me because they're in trouble. Whew, that's a hard one to, you know, when something's coming at you like that, it's hard not to take it personal. And the other thing is, don't assume anything because you have no idea what's really going on. You make all these assumptions. Well, you know, they looked at me and or they said that or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> completely wrong you're yeah. doing all this to yourself yeah so and there's other ones that's heavy the other two are just as heavy but those are the ones i remember love it number five was there a vulnerability you once hid within and that became your superpower sensitivity mm. i remember i used to always get teased because i was sensitive i am very sensitive i'm very strong and powerful but i'm very very sensitive and i'm grateful now but back then it was like you know i'd come home and you know be crying because somebody made fun of me and they made even more fun of me because they could see i'd be crying or i was sensitive and my mom thank god was always supportive and saying you know no no whatever they say like you're stupid or whatever they said no you're not stupid but the thing is you of course your mom's going to say you're not stupid but i want billy john and tom and Whoever else to think I'm cool. Mm. My friends. I know, Mom, you think I'm cool. You're my mom. But I want my friends to. So anyway, <laughs> what happened was, and I remember, without mentioning names, being in really tough situations where I wanted to stay there. If, if anybody's ever had a job or a boss or even a relationship, you want to be in that situation, especially a job, because you see the benefits. It's going to get me further and but you're working with complete dicks, you know. Um, that's a tough, that's a tough space to be in, and um, it, it, there's no shortcuts to learning. But I think what happened with me is I started to go more this direction, not look for validation from everybody there. Mm -hmm. I was looking more inward. You 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 start to validate yourself. You start to believe in yourself. You start to uh, you know, I have a thing called grace, you know, uh, gratitude for yourself, a respect for yourself, the R, the appreciation A for yourself, C, compassion for yourself, and E, empathy. 
And by the way, you go this way and then you go that way mm. to other people. But the the grace, I didn't know any of that stuff when I was a kid, you know. I it just sort of came up with this recently. But um, then you start feeling power. I started to feel powerful and sensitive. So, yeah, I'm sensitive. Yeah. I love like, it, you know, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Oh, man. Failure is great, man. Well, there's no failure, there's no mistakes, but if you want to call it failure, though, that's that's the greatest moment to learn. Mm. When you, I tell people when you're, you know, oh, I just got fired, this is, you're going to get hired again, number one. This is that mm, badass moment where now you can fight your way up because you're going to go up. If you're down here, now you only have one way to go, which is up, and learn from what you just went through so that you go up even higher. Mm. Failure, failure, those things are all just, Great learning lessons. It's a great moment. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Jimi Hendrix. Mm. I always wanted to talk to him. Um, Winston Churchill. Yeah. Smoke a scar with him. <laughs> All those quotes and like. Oh, it'd be know, great, wouldn't it? It'd yeah. be fun. And I think it'd be really cool to talk to Jesus. Yeah. I'd say, you know, dude. If there was ever time to come back, right now would be a perfect <laughs> yeah, time. Especially ahead of the 2024 election cycle in America. Yeah, you could just kind of come back and tell people, nah, you're not supposed to shoot people and you're not supposed to lie and cheat. You're lying. Uh, number eight, let's mix it up for this one. What song that is already out now do you wish that you, were, that you played on originally? Ah, oh, that wasn't on the list. A song that's out now. Yeah, is there a favorite song of yours, or something that you've just really a memorable song through throughout your life? So many, yeah, so many. We're talking about Jimi Hendrix, Mm -hmm. you know, like Purple Haze. You know, (laughs) you know that just completely spun my head. Uh, Bullet to Butterfly Wings, Mm -hmm. the Smashing Pumpkins. Oh man, I mean, I could go. uh, Elton John's greatest hit, uh, Steely Dan, Asia. (laughs) Um, um, So many. I mean, this is so many. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, they're good. They're good, Kenny. I think Stevie they're... Wonder. I mean, you know, you know, superstition. You know, oh my God, the Who. <laughs> I won't get fooled again. Uh, number nine. Share one thing on your bucket list. Anything left that you, that you haven't? I know you've lived nine lives already. What's one thing on your bucket list that you haven't that you haven't yet done? I don't have a bucket list. Yeah, I'm doing it. Mm. I swear to God, I've never sit there going ah, someday. I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm fine. No bucket list. Yeah, great example. Final question, number 10. What's one thing you do to win the day? To win the day? Mm-hmm. I'd say it, that grace thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I wake up and I, and I try to remember to say that in the morning and at night. Kenny, have gratitude to who you are. Appreciate yourself. I mean, respect yourself. Appreciate yourself. Um, and have compassion, man. And have empathy for yourself when you are not. Because once you, you're feeling that this way, you can project it out to other people. Yeah. It starts from here. You know, that whole thing. Love yourself so you can love others. You know, that kind of It's so true. true. Mm. It really is. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Kenny, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Kerry, uh, Kenny Aronoff. And grab a copy of his autobiography, Sex, Drums, and Rock and Roll, and visit his website, KennyAronoff.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. What an absolute pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Win the Day show. I didn't, is, what, weren't we on for 10 minutes just now? <laughs> it feels like 10 minutes, doesn't it? Uh, time flew. We'll have to get you back for another one. Well, when, when I come back, I'm going to interview you. I love it. Yeah, get ready, dude, because I come from that rock and roll world. <laughs> anyway, thank you for having me. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed that interview. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway so our guests know they made a difference in your life today. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe or follow button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. The Win The Day podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.